Hey friends, welcome to Make Anything. It's Devin here, and in last week's video, I shared my process for modeling and printing these really cool printception vases and containers. And when it comes to promoting your 3D models, of course having a really cool model is important, but presentation is arguably just as important. So in today's video, I thought I would share my process for taking photos of my 3D prints. And while I'm not a professional photographer by trade, I have built my 3D printing business from the ground up, and I've certainly learned a lot of tricks when it comes to photography. So that's what today's video is about. And regardless of your current setup or level of expertise when it comes to taking photos, hopefully you can watch this video and take away some useful information. Now, of course, there's many ways to get any job done, but I think what I've come up with is a good way to take really clear and clean photos of my prints so if someone's gonna purchase a print or a 3D model for printing, they have a good idea of what they're gonna get. So without further ado, let's take some photos. Cool. So when it comes to taking really clean and professional looking photos of your 3D prints, I would argue that the two most important things that you need to keep in mind are the lighting and the backdrop. Note that I didn't say the camera because honestly, with the quality of cameras on modern day smartphones, most of you are probably already covered. Although yeah, having a nice DSLR camera or something like that definitely helps and I'll talk about my setup later. But backdrop and lighting are the things that will really take your 3D print photos to the next level. There are a few approaches when it comes to the backdrops of your photos, of course. It's good to have a photo of your product or print in context. So if you're printing an accessory for your mailbox, you probably want to put it on your mailbox and take a photo of it as it's actually being used because that will help people understand the function of your 3D print. But in general, the most straightforward and really clean looking approach is just a solid backdrop. So probably the easiest way to do that is just to tape up a piece of paper against your wall or even just some kind of little setup. Since most 3D prints are tiny, you can do something as simple as taping a piece of paper onto a binder or a box and creating a little seamless background like that. A seamless just means that the sheet goes from the wall or the vertical surface down to the flat ground in a clean sweep. And that helps hide the horizon line in your prints. It creates a much cleaner, just blank background and it makes a really big difference. So you don't want to just tape up your piece of paper like this. That'll create this kind of ugly and distracting line on the bottom. Giving it that sweep hides that distraction that is the horizon line and brings the focus more so to your 3D print. Now this is a pretty janky setup and it probably won't satisfy you for too long. And if you're planning on printing more than just a couple of 3D prints, I would definitely recommend a photo softbox kind of like this one. Woo. So this is a little photo tent that I got off of Amazon from a company called Niwer. They're a pretty great budget photo company and a lot of my photo equipment has come from them. The great thing about this tent is it helps you take care of both the backdrop and lighting in one little portable studio. And this is pretty much the perfect size for a lot of 3D prints. As I mentioned, one of my two key components is lighting, and I really love this softbox because it's got these translucent white walls, which allow you to shine in lights from the side that hit the diffuser and basically create soft shadows. So when I said lighting is important, it's not only getting sufficient light, but it's also creating nice soft lighting that prevents harsh shadows. So if you are shooting in context outside, you're probably better off shooting on a cloudy day when the light is scattered from the clouds. If you do have to shoot in harsh sunlight, you can still remedy the situation a bit by bouncing light using something as simple as that white sheet of printer paper we used earlier. Or if you're gonna be doing it often, you might wanna invest in a reflector, which does a pretty impressive job of brightening up those shadows. Anyways, yeah, so this box is great because it helps you diffuse the light and like I said, it gives you this nice contained backdrop. This Neewer box comes with a few of these different sheets so you can swap out backdrops with Velcro. But honestly, this kind of gross nylon material is very annoying to work with. It's really hard to keep out the wrinkles. So my approach is just to use a paper backdrop. 
So this is a big sheet of cardstock I got from my local art supply warehouse. And these things are super cheap. This was like a dollar. And you can just fit it perfectly inside of that soft box. It stays in place. And as you can see there, it goes from the vertical to the horizontal surface to create that nice seamless backdrop. With that piece of paper thrown in there, I can just plop down one of my 3D models and I've already got a really nice scene to photograph here. Really, now I just need to make sure that I've got pretty good lighting and of course I'm filming so my lighting is decent. I'm using these bad boys which are LED shop lights that I've converted into studio lights by sticking on a tripod stand. I made an entire video about this a while back so you can click on that link. And these things are awesome because they're just a huge amount of light that I can orient in all kinds of different ways and they're pretty cheap as well. The only change I made since my last video is taping on this diffusing sheet which helps create that softer lighting. This sheet was actually just stolen out of a broken LCD TV. If you're not aware, the inside of TVs have a lot of really cool filters including these soft diffusers and they also often have a thicker piece of diffusing acrylic which spreads the light inside the TV and when you put it in front of lights for your studio photography they kind of have the same effect. Alternatively, you can count on newer to provide some nice lighting equipment as well. So this is kind of the higher end giant LED light panels. There's also these tiny ones they sell which I think are like 15-20 bucks. Nice battery powered portable lights. They have these diffuser sheets on them which help create that soft lighting. This one also has that soft lighting and it allows you to transition between warm and cool temperature which is nice. Although generally you just want a really bright white light especially when you're shooting on a bright white background. As I mentioned we want to use the diffusing property of this softbox so what I tend to do is tilt my lights so a lot of it is coming from the sides and taking advantage of that diffusion but there's also a bit of light coming from the front so that of course the front is well lit since that's where we're taking the photo from. But by having those diffused lights coming from the side you basically eliminate shadows from both directions and if you take a look now it's a pretty awesome clean white backdrop. Another tip is just to make sure everything is really nice and clean otherwise you can spend a lot of time editing things to try to clean it up after the fact. You're almost always better off fixing things with the actual photo instead of fixing it in post. I really love these bulb dusters. They're great for cleaning the set as well as cleaning camera equipment, computer parts, just about everything. Get yourself a bulb duster. So this is pretty much already my dream budget professional photo setup. It's that balance between budget and looking really good. We've got the two task lamps pointed diagonally and downwards from the side and the front shining through that soft box and with these diffusers to get a really nice soft light that more or less kills all the shadows and gets us a nice well lit photo. The soft box is a dream and this paper backdrop really helps create a nice clean wrinkle free smooth backdrop. Also as I mentioned they're super cheap so you can buy a whole bunch of different colors so that helps you get creative with your photography. Speaking of colored backdrops a nice bright white backdrop is almost always a great option but if for example you're shooting an entirely white 3D print you don't want to use a white backdrop otherwise it's going to kind of disappear in the photo unless that's your artistic intent. So while you're picking up that white backdrop it might be a good idea to also pick up a nice medium gray or even a black backdrop if you want a really intense photo. So this softbox here is basically what I've used for many years to take all the photos for my mini factory when I present my models and for a lot of thumbnails here on make anything as well. And it served me super well. It's pretty much the perfect size for 3D prints. But like today, we've got this guy, which is maybe a little bit on the larger side, though it would fit. But um, the real issue is when I'm taking videos of these parts, if I want a video on the real nice white backdrop, uh, it's not quite wide enough. So I did recently upgrade to a slightly larger set. Let me set that up for you. Voila, here is my latest upgrade to my photo setup. And what I did here is basically drape this large piece of photo paper from the top-down camera mount that I custom built several years ago. I have a live stream about that 
it's a project of its own, but by draping this nice large sheet of paper, I now have a lot more room to work with so I can photograph larger objects, multiple objects together, and I can also film and get multiple angles while still having the background stay this beautiful seamless white. Now, unlike the softbox, this doesn't have diffusers set in, but with the diffusers that I built into my uh, task lights, that's generally enough. If I place them well, I can still put down objects and have a pretty minimal shadow. So this totally works. I do still use the photo box often because it's just a little more convenient than setting this up, but I have used this a few times and it's super handy. Another option would be to use a fabric backdrop. They're often made out of muslin, but I just found that this is way easier for creating a really clean backdrop and I don't have to worry about wrinkles, which can always be a problem. I do have my green screen back there on a cable so I can run it across the entire room. So for green screen photos, that's nice, but uh, this is just way more convenient and clean. Regarding the camera I'm using, well, like I mentioned, most smartphones can probably take a pretty good photo, and if you do take care of the backdrop and clean lighting, then your photos should come out quite nice. But if you're trying to reach that next level of professionalism, upgrading your camera equipment is something that you can pretty much do endlessly. So I'm gonna be using a DSLR camera, specifically the Canon 77D, and it's kind of a mid-range DSLR. What's great about a dedicated camera is it lets you control a lot more of the fine-tuned settings so we can adjust aperture, focus, exposure, things like that. Also, being able to shoot a raw image rather than a JPEG is really nice when you bring things into Photoshop. It lets you bring out detail in the shadows and highlights that you wouldn't be able to get with a compressed image like a JPEG. So there is definitely still a case for getting a DSLR. In terms of the lens, I basically do all my shooting on the Sigma 18 to 35 art lens, which many people would say is the definitive best single lens you can get for a cropped sensor camera like this 77D. Uh, that's not the one on here. I'm actually filming with that lens right now, so you can kind of get an idea of how nice and sharp it can make images look. A really nice lens on a DSLR camera does still beat a cell phone, so there's still a case for having a big camera like this. I've also got my camera on a tripod, which can certainly be helpful for composing shots and for letting you have a longer shutter speed. So especially if you have insufficient lighting, a tripod can be a lifesaver. Anyways, let's get started with our photography. I'll start by cleaning up my model, making sure to clean away any wisps of filament or pieces of dust. I'll use that bulb duster again. Now that we've got a nice clean model on a well-lit set with this perfect white backdrop, we can go ahead and start orienting our model and trying to figure out the best shots. There's no perfect formula for this as the shots you take will depend on what you're taking photos of. With something like this vase, side shots are usually really good, but I generally just try to pose my prints in ways that look really cool and show the product accurately as it will look when someone's got it printed out. And even though I'm trying to take simple photos on this white backdrop, I will still bring in props now and then if it helps show the function of the print. So in this case, I crafted up these flowers made from failed prints that I cut up, and I've got my trusty Uhu putty to help hold those into place and pose everything correctly. I use this putty all the time for sticking things together in a non-destructive way. It's definitely a must-have for my photography arsenal. There we go. I made a nice arrangement that complements my print without distracting from it too much, and it comes together to make a pretty interesting composition. When it comes to taking photos, I definitely try to take too many photos rather than too few because it's far easier to delete a few photos rather than having to reshoot on another day. In fact, I even took the time to make this time-lapse photo by spinning my vase little by little. I thought it would be a great way to show off the twisting motion, and in this case, I certainly think it paid off. All right, now let's jump onto the computer where I've brought in all my photos. Like I said, I like taking a lot of photos, so here we have over 150 shots of my Prinception vases. And usually I'll run through all of these and flag my favorite ones to decide which ones to edit. But for now, let's just go ahead and edit this one right here. I do most of my editing in Camera Raw, which is a Photoshop plugin, but Lightroom has most of the same features. And you can probably tell that this photo is a bit overexposed. 
But since I took this photo in the raw format, I can bring down my exposure here in the software without degrading the quality much at all. But first, let me share this cool trick of mine when it comes to color balancing on a white backdrop. Since we know this background is supposed to be perfectly white, what I'll do is bring up my vibrance and saturation all the way up, and then I'll also bring the exposure down. And that really brings out the true color of this backdrop in the photo. Obviously it's too blue here, so I can now slide the temperature slider up until it just seems to flip flop between being a little cool and a little warm. Then I can reset my exposure and saturation and vibrance, and I'll know I have this perfectly white balanced photo. Though, like I said, this photo is a bit overexposed, so I will bring down that exposure a tad, as well as the highlights, since I do want this flower to be separated from the backdrop as much as possible. This is kind of what I was talking about, about not shooting white products on a white backdrop, but in this case it's a prop, so it's not a big deal. Under the detail tab here, I'll bring up the noise reduction for luminance, which gets rid of some of the grain in my photo. And I'll also go into the lens correction tab, where I can quickly get rid of any chromatic aberration and distortion from my lens. We'll zoom out, and that's pretty much all I have to do here in Camera Raw. I will go ahead and crop this photo to a square, since that's the standard that Instagram's created, unfortunately. I'll just go ahead and visually center that, and maybe make a few more adjustments with the highlights and shadows, just to get the colors completely right. And then I can open the image in Photoshop. In Photoshop, I'll just bring up my Levels tab and make sure that my brightest white is in fact true white, just by moving this slider over to the beginning of this peak. And I'm already pretty happy with this photo since we did have a really nice clean set, but I might still use the clone tool to fix some smudges like this, just to eliminate anything that could distract the viewer from the purpose of the photo, which is the model. In this case, I'll also use the burn tool here on these flowers just to try to separate them from the backdrop a tiny bit. All right, I think that's a pretty great photo, so now I'll just save it out as a JPEG file so I can share it on the internet. I threw together this quick little slideshow of some of my photos. As you'll see, I try to take a good variety of photos, some very clear and informative direct shots, as well as some more creative and expressive angles also, if you've got multiple parts or some kind of assembly process, I try to show that in photos as well. I'll often hand model as well because not only does that bring a human touch to my photos, but it provides a sense of scale, especially with models like this that are intentionally playing with the sense of scale. Here's a good example of one photo showing the functional use of the part and another where I arranged it a bit more artistically just to show off the cool form of the piece. I also think it's good to combine wide shots of the entire product, as well as close-ups that focus in on some of the most important details. And here are just a couple more shots of my different containers. With a vase like this, you can see it's really that low straight on side view that gives the clearest image of the form here. I also took these shots of my prints that look like bigger prints inside of other prints that look like prints in other prints. Ultimate Printception. Really, just try to have fun with your photos and play around while you're taking shots because often that's how you get your best shots. All right, well, that's just about all the advice I've got when it comes to taking photos of your 3D prints. Like I said, I'm not a professional photographer, but I have picked up some knowledge throughout the years and this is what I do to get really nice, crisp, clear photos of my prints. I think they turned out pretty well, but I'm always looking forward to learning from you guys just as much as I hope you learn from my videos. So if you noticed anything in my photos or if you just have any general advice, I'd love to hear it in the comments below. Anyways, that's all I've got for you today. So I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something new and I hope to see you in the next one. But until then, I'm Devin, this is Make Anything, and as always, stay inspired. <laughs>